Welcome back everybody and we're going to be discussing uh, further ideas on probability models today which are taking all the uh, possibilities that a situation could have and comparing uh, what types of uh, events or outcomes are more likely so that way you can make better choices. This set of notes really talks about the total number of possibilities uh, and figuring out how um, many options there could be in the end. So in a way, it relates back to sample spaces when we were discussing uh, probabilities from last chapter. The first and simplest idea that we can talk about is called the general multiplication rule. That says that for any process involving multiple options or multiple steps, the total number of possible ways, the total number of different ways to complete that process is just the product, meaning multiplication, of those options. And that sounds pretty convoluted, but the name kind of gives away that you are multiplying the possibilities up. Right beneath this definition is our first problem, so that way you can see how this works. Suppose that you're playing a new board game where your moves and strategies are kind of based on uh, tossing a fair coin, an eight-sided dice, and a regular six-sided dice. How many different moves would be possible? So maybe they would have a big map of all these different combinations. In total, how many things are you looking at? So in order to figure out the total number of combinations, the total number of possibilities, you take two, which is the number of options for a coin, heads or tails, right? Times eight, which is the number of possibilities for this eight-sided dice, and then you multiply those by six, the options that go with a regular six-sided dice. So you can see if we have the two strange dice, you have all of these different possibilities, and if we multiply those end results by two, Okay, you have a set of those dice results for heads, and you have a set of those dice results for tails. You can kind of tell why we're multiplying those things up. So in your calculator or in your head, if you're good at that, you multiply 2 times 8 times 6, which is 96 total options. So there are 96 unique different combinations of those three events. That's a lot of possibilities. Well, what about number 2? This says a bank requires customers to choose a four-character PIN number, okay, a personal identification code, uh, to access accounts on their ATM machines. Now, the bank requires that three of the characters be a digit, zero through nine, while one of the characters must be a letter. And if you think about the alphabet, there are 26 different letters in our alphabet. So how many different codes are possible? Now, I like to think about these questions in terms of uh, blanks, the possibilities that could go in the four-digit uh, pin. And so the first three blanks have to be numbers, digits 0 through 9. And you can choose anything you want. So 0 through 9 in the first spot, 0 through 9 in the second spot, 0 through 9 in the third spot as well. And so if you're thinking about possibilities, that's 10 digits, 10 digits, 10 digits. And we're multiplying those up. So out of the first three, you could have a thousand. But it's that last space that kind of makes things a little bit um, more secure because there's a letter that goes with it. And so those 26 letters in our alphabet gets multiplied by the thousand different digits that are possible for the first three spots. And so you have uh, 10 times 10 times 10 times 26, which is 26,000 different ID codes. That's a lot. It's still not as many as uh, you would maybe need for a bank or, or a company that has a lot of people working with them. Number three, some restaurants open a special menu to larger parties, and that might include things like appetizers, main courses, and uh, desserts. And suppose a restaurant's menu gives three choices of an appetizer, five choices for entrees, and two dessert options. How many different meal selections are possible? How many days could you go as a, a large group and get something different? If we're going to go ahead and think this through, three of those options were appetizers. So you have three possibilities. And then in the entree, which is your main course, you would have five different options. And you end up with two options for desserts. Multiplying three times five times two, which is pretty simple, you get 30 different meal combinations. So you could go pretty much every day of the month and get something slightly new. A lot of those meals might be similar. The appetizer and the entree would be the same, but it would only be the dessert that changes. Or maybe it would be the appetizer that changes, and then you have the same entree and dessert. So a lot of them have similarities, but there are 30 unique 
meal combinations. Number four might not resonate uh, with you guys as much as it uh, has with past classes, but Mr. Chipman, who was our vice principal here at JHS for a while, would uh, once a week get to say the pledge and give an encouraging message and uh, you know life thoughts with Mr. Chipman. And it was always a, a good time and always something to think about. But we always would chuckle uh, because Mr. Chipman, being an English teacher, loved to add some flair to the Pledge of Allegiance. And so he would have some different styles or emphasize things. Uh, and it always seemed every single week it was a little different. And so I was wondering, how many different ways could you potentially say the Pledge of Allegiance? If he said it different every single week, how long could we go with a unique Pledge of Allegiance? And so the different ways that you might be able to say the Pledge of Allegiance, you could have regular intonation, you could emphasize, or you could pause before saying another word. And you would do that maybe for effect or to, to put some oomph behind your words and what you're saying. So what we have to know here is the length of the Pledge of Allegiance. Similar to with the code, the pin number, you have all of these different words and you have different ways to emphasize those words. So I pledge allegiance to the flag. And in total, we have 31 different words in the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, because those three ways to emphasize each word are there, you have three different ways to say the word I, three different ways to say the, the word pledge, three different ways to say the word allegiance. I pledge allegiance. And it helps to take this bigger problem and boil it down into just maybe the first couple of words. I pledge allegiance. So you can say I with regular intonation, I, italic emphasis, if you will, and then pause. I pledge. And so if we take three times three times three times three for all of the words in the Pledge of Allegiance, since there are 31, that is three to the 31st power. And that, if you put it in your calculator, is a very large number. It is 617 trillion, 673 billion, 396 million, 283,947 different weeks that you could say a unique pledge, which I was interested, how many years is that? That's over a y 11 trillion years. So we have quite a few left over before we ever finish up. I'm waiting for the time when we get uh, all of the words to have a pause for emphasis. That'll be a great week. So this group of first questions are all related because you are multiplying um, the number of possibilities up. And this is the, the simplest base foundation that we can do to figure out our sample space, how, how many options there are. Okay, and you can see that sometimes we just have different amounts multiplied, sometimes we have the same amount multiplied, in which case you can use an exponent. But what we're getting closer to is using some math that you probably have never seen before. Okay, and it it goes with the idea of you multiply and multiply and multiply until you're done with the number of options. But this type of multiplying has a special pattern. Okay, it gradually gets smaller and smaller and smaller because there are less possibilities. And this idea, you may have seen it in math books or on your calculator, as an exclamation point because it's exciting, right? It's called a factorial. So what is a factorial? A factorial is the product or the multiplication of the number, and usually we use the letter n to represent any number that we want, and you multiply that number by one less than what it was, by one less than that value, by one less than even that value, until you get all the way down to multiplying by one at the end. So usually we would write that as n exclamation point, n factorial. And so there's this nice little formula you go all the way from the number you're choosing, all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1 at the end. And there are some things that you have to define to make this work mathematically. Zero factorial is defined to be 1. There's a little bit of arguments about that process, but don't ask me why yet. As an example, 6 factorial would be 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 
six possibilities, five possibilities, four possibilities, three possibilities, two possibilities, and it is one possibility in the end. Okay, so factorials in a way are the general multiplication rule, but it, it changes as you go down, and we'll see how that fits into different situations coming up. The answer to that six factorial that I just talked about would be 720 different possibilities, and that's a small factorial, which is crazy. 10 factorial, 10 times 9 times 8, all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1, is 3,628,800 different possibilities. So just going up 4 more, from 6 to 10, it, it is ridiculous how many more possibilities you get. The number of possibilities just explode. They get so outrageously large. 3 factorial, 3 exclamation point, very easy. 3 times 2 times 1, which is just 6 in the end. And so factorials deal with problems when there are n options. And you have to use all of those options up. And the idea behind that is that as you use more and more options, as you progress along, there are less and less things left over to multiply by. And you can't use those things again because they've already been set in stone. They've already been used. And so let's look at 5. 5 will emphasize this point. Suppose that an assembly operation in a manufacturing plant involves four steps, which can be completed really in any sequence. The manufacturer wishes to compare the assembly time for each of the different sequences. So how many different sequences can be involved in this little experiment? So if you're looking at the first thing that they have to do, there are four different processes. They can choose any of the four, but once they choose to go with one of them, that limits the amount of possibilities here in the next step. So from four, the second series of things to happen for this assembly operation is that there are three. We've used one, so that leaves three left over. So we can choose any of those three. So we have four possibilities multiplied now by three possibilities. And once we set that second step in the stone, we're left with a little bit less. And so there could be two possibilities now. And once we choose one of those to say this is our next step, that leaves us with the last option. There's only one thing left. So we had four things to start, three things next, two things, and then once we've chosen to put this, this, and this in order, we're left with one thing. So the total number of possibilities, four times three times two times one, is 24 different assembly options. And so this company would want to test all 24 of those and record how long it takes for them to make their product, whatever that might be. And to be most efficient, they probably would choose the fastest one or the one that's maybe cheapest um, or anything like that. That problem can be represented by four factorial. Okay, and you use factorials when you're using everything, all four steps, uh, finish to end. Some of these questions are really cool. So number six uh, talks about IKEA. And I don't know if you've ever been to IKEA or not, but it's a Swedish-based uh, design company and they sell uh, furniture and other things that you have to put together in your own house. Kitchen appliances, home accessories, um, lights, all this cool stuff. Um, so they're a design firm. And one of the unique things about IKEA is that they always give their products extremely unique names. Being Swedish, they don't um, roll off the tongue as uh, you might think here in America. And recently, uh, a couple years ago, I was able to visit my first IKEA up in Schaumburg, Illinois, and as I was wandering around, just looking at the incredible amounts of stuff, I was wondering if they think of their product names by just scrambling up letters and putting them together and saying, oh, what a beautiful name. So I came across this cheese grater. And you can see, I have no clue how to pronounce it, but it's very affordable. It's $5, and it has this nice little design and all these little things. So being facetious, I, I thought to myself, well, if you were to just use those letters, and rearrange them into a new name for a new product, how many different uh, times could you get away with that? How many unique names can be uh, achieved by just using this one word? And so if you think about, uh, first, how many letters? There are seven total, C-H-O-S-I-G-T. Well, in the first position of our new name, we could choose any of those seven. And so we're gonna take any of those seven, we're gonna plop one into that first spot. But after that, we have the remaining chunk, and in this next spot, I only have six to choose from. So I'm gonna plop one in there out of the six. 
and I'm going to plop another in with the, the five remaining letters, and that continues until I've used all of these letters. When you get down towards the end, you might have two options, and then once you plop that letter in, there is one remaining option in the last blank. And so seven factorial, seven times six times five times four times three times two times one, is 5,040 different unique names. So just from this one item, you have uh, thousands of possibilities by rearranging. Now, some might not make sense, like grammatically, um, you might not be able to pronounce them, but it would be a slightly different name. Even in this option, if I switch at the very end the G and the T, that is one of those 5,040 unique new names. And so it's kind of funny to poke fun at uh, companies that do this, or IKEA in general, um, just because they're known for their unique names. Question seven. A teacher has 15 seats in their classroom and then 15 students in a particular class. How many different seating arrangements are possible? And it's important here that we are filling up all the seats, 15 students and 15 seats. Now it's not going to be 15 times 15, which might be your initial reaction, but it's that every seat is being used. Okay, because you're using every single seat, every possibility, factorials are really the way to go here. So think about that first chair, okay? In that first spot, you can place any of the 15 students. It doesn't matter who. Once you put that person in that seat and you move to the next chair, you only have 14 of the remaining students left. And so you're going to put one of the 14 in there. And you can start to see the pattern. We had 15, then we had 14. Now in the next third chair, we're going to have 13 and then 12, 11, and it just keeps on going. So mathematically, this is 15 factorial, which you don't have to write all the way out. Just put 15 exclamation point. That says factorial. And putting that into your calculator, there is an option to find that. I'll try to show you where that menu is. Or, but hitting enter on your calculator with 15 factorial is 1,307,674,000,000. Different seating charts. These possibilities are almost endless. It's crazy. Switching the first two people, new possibility, new seating chart. Switching the last two people, switching the first and the last person, and that's just switching two, let alone you switching four or five people or all 15. Factorials grow ridiculously fast. Earlier in the notes, we played the game Deal or No Deal which has 26 different cases that you could choose from. And if we think back to that problem and when we played, how many different unique games could there be? Meaning, if I chose a different case to pick, or if I chose uh, maybe different cases to get rid of during, during the gameplay, how many different TV shows could be created? This is going to be ridiculously large. The larger the number of possibilities or options, the bigger a factorial will get. And so the 26 cases, if I am going to pick one right away and then pick another and then pick another, it's 26 options, 25 options, 24 options, it's 26 factorial. And typing that might make your calculator uh, overflow. It's such a big number your calculator can't remember or do all of the, the processing. But uh, if you try this in a computer, these are the digits. I don't know how big this is. It's 403-291-461-126-605-635-584-000-000. That's the number of different games that you could have in Deal or No Deal. I can probably guarantee that they will not be on air long enough to see every game happen. That is a ridiculous, mind-boggling number. But we wouldn't have been able to think about this or do this without factorials. This is kind of how the second section of uh, this chapter is important. Now factorials are unique in that they have to use every single item. You can't stop before you get to the end, and that's important. Sometimes there are situations where you don't want to use everything. Think about deal or no deal. You could take five of those cases and then quit the game and be done. You take the banker's offer or things like that. So stopping early actually is not a full factorial. It's a, a kind of a limited factorial. And so typically 
uh, there are ways to get around the fact that you're stopping early and not using everything. And it deals a little bit with dividing. So factorials are a lot of multiplying. You multiply all those options until you get to the end. But if you want to stop early, you need to be dividing by the numbers that you want to snip or cut away. What if I'm dealing with 6 factorial? 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. But instead of going all the way down to the end, I wanted to stop when I got to 3 instead of 1. And so the numbers that are uh, needing to be snipped away or pruned would be 2 and 1 at the very, very end. So I need 6 times 5 times 4 times 3. Then I'm done. So in order to do that, I have to divide by the things that need to be going away. So 2 and 1 is what I'm going to divide by underneath. And if you are sharp, you're kind of realizing that we are dividing by another factorial. 2 times 1, it's a very small factorial, but it's still a factorial. If I wanted to maybe stop all the way at 6 and 5 being left, I would be dividing by 4 factorial. 4, 3, 2, 1. And dividing by those numbers gets rid of the tail end of the whole factorial. Factorials use everything, but this next idea that we're going to gets to stop short. Okay, It takes the first part. And that's a very powerful idea. So to stop at 3 instead of stopping all the way at 1, it would be 6 factorial divided by 2 factorial. The 2 factorial chops off 2 times 1 from the original factorial. Below, if I'm dealing with 10 factorial and I'm going to stop at 4, Okay, 4 is my last digit, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Well, I need to divide by 3 factorial. That cuts the 3, 2, 1 off of that original factorial. So 10 factorial divided by 3 factorial. Being able to snip and slice uh, these original full-length factorials is something that you're going to have to get uh, good at. And this pushes us towards the next idea, which is called a permutation. Permutations are distinct arrangements of individuals where the order matters. Permutation placement matters. So if I switch the order of just two individuals, I create a new arrangement. It's unique from the first series. Now, this permutation, this idea, has a symbol notation. It has a little n, a big P, and then a little k. Those small positions are called subscripts. The p is regular sized. And p stands here for permutation. But what do the n and the k stand for? Well, n represents the total number of things that you could be selecting from. It's the whole group out of this much. k, the number that's behind p, is saying how many things you are selecting from those n objects. So you have this group and you want to take a permutation of this many objects. Okay, You want to have a distinct arrangement of this many items from that original big group. So it's always going to be the big number first and then the small number second. Okay, Your whole group and then k amount of things you're selecting from. And there's a mathematical formula that goes with this idea. So a permutation, n, p, k, is n factorial divided by n minus k factorial. If you think about what we just talked about, snipping the end of a factorial, you have the original factorial and you need to divide away this smaller factorial of where you want to stop. So we'll see some examples here where I show you the work and why dividing by this n minus k factorial is really just snipping the original size factorial so it stops early. It's, you aren't using everything. So permutations are typically going to be smaller than factorials. Factorials are the whole permutations would stop before you get to the end. But it's a powerful idea because not every situation needs to use everything. And we'll see that here in a couple of these problems. So Illinois has some pretty strict regulations on uh, vehicle license plates. If you are going to get a vanity, which is a regular license plate, you can't have more than three numbers or one to seven letters. Now, if you're ordering a personalized license plate, which is how people get all those wild, ridiculous license plates, uh, you're allowed to intermingle both letters and numbers. Now, if you're going to choose to personalize your own license plate, you're going to have to pay a little bit more money. That's how the state makes uh, money, even though we're crazy in debt. 
And I'm wondering how many different unique license plate combinations could you choose from if you are going to personalize your own license plate? So the total number of possibilities, we can mix letters and uh, numbers total. And so if you have 10 digits, 0 through 9, that can be put in any spot, and you have 26 letters, A through Z, that can be put in any spot, how many things do we really have to choose from for each of these positions? Well, 10 plus 26 is 36 total options that could go in any of the license plate uh, spots. Now, we aren't choosing a license plate that is 36 things long. If you read the question, it has to be limited to seven spaces, if you will. So a license plate isn't a whole sentence, it's just seven things, and people will take and spell out something clever in those seven spaces. So we're only choosing seven places worth of those 36 possibilities. And so to set this up, we have to go ahead and use a permutation. Now, permutations, remember, the order matters. If I have um, a license plate that says math guy, that is different than somebody who says guy math. All right, the order of those positions is important here. And so they would be unique license plates for different vehicles. So out of the 36 things that I could choose from, it's going to be a permutation where the order matters and I am picking seven things for our license plate. That's how many things we have on our license plate. So 36 factorial over divided by 36 minus 7 factorial. So if we do that math down below, that's 29 factorial. What this does is it takes 36 times 35 times 34 times 33 times 32 times 31 all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1 at the end. But it's dividing it by 29 times 28 times 27. It's dividing and snipping away the stuff that we do not use. So there are seven numbers that are left up at the top. And if we go ahead and we type that in our calculator, 36 factorial divided by 29 factorial, we get 42,072,307,200 different license plates that you could customize. That is a lot of license plates. That's more than the state would probably need ever. <laughs> Interestingly enough, uh, out of these 42 billion options are all of the regular license plates as well. This is just saying how many different ways could you uh, make a unique license plate. And so this, if somebody wanted to have a personalized plate that said A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then that's possible. And so that would maybe be a vanity plate as well, um, just a regular license plate. But the important thing to remember with permutations is that the order matters. Switching just two positions changes and creates a new unique answer. Now you might wonder, well, what if I don't care about the order? Okay, like what if putting something first and putting something second is the same thing? Like I don't care. Well, then you're not talking so much about the sequences of events or the, the list as it goes, but you're talking about the group. And there is an idea that deals with factorials, and it's similar to permutations, that doesn't care. It's about the combination or the group of things. And I kind of gave away what it's called. So this idea, this different idea where order doesn't matter, it's called a combination. And combinations are selections of individuals that form some group. It's the group together that matters, not the order that they are selected, OK? Switching the order of two or more of these individuals doesn't make a difference. Now, just like permutations have this symbol notation, combinations are set up in a likewise manner. So you have n as a subscript, c as a large, regular size number, large in comparison, and then you have k. And n and k represent the same ideas as for permutations. n is the total number of things that you could select from out of this much. C just tells us it's a combination and not a permutation. And then the K is how many things you are selecting, a smaller amount, or maybe the same size, as what you have available to you. And the mathematical formula that goes with this, if you look, almost seems identical to permutations. So N, C, K. Out of N options, I'm choosing a combination of K items. 
is n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial. Now if you are really on top of your game today, permutations are hidden inside of combinations. The n factorial and then divided by n minus k factorial, that is a permutation. But a combination divides by a little bit extra. And it's dividing by that extra because it is getting rid of all of those possible switches. And it's saying, well, if I switch these two people, that's the same group. And so I don't want to count those as distinct things. So in the grand scheme of things, factorials are the full length, permutations are if you stop early, and combinations are even a smaller subset of that where I don't care about all the distinct little flips. Okay, it's just the grouping at the end that I'm interested in. And so that's kind of a nice way to see how all of these things relate. And you need to uh, be able to recognize these different situations for what they are. Sometimes it doesn't matter uh, when we start to do probabilities, uh, as long as you're comparing or dividing the correct items, you're still going to get the same or correct probability if it's a combination versus if it's a permutation. But I don't want to get too far into that because we have to get our heads around what a combination does and how it works. So let's look at question number 10. You're in a fast food restaurant and you want to live life on the edge a little bit, so you order a large soft drink. Yeah, which large soft drinks are like this tall anyway, right? So you're set. But hey, let's take today and turn it up to an 11. I mean, a large drink, that's cool, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to make a super mix. As kids, we would call this the suicide drink because you mix all of the different sodas and you're like, oh, it tastes awful, but you don't want to say that in real life. So we're making some super awesome uh, mega drink. So this is similar to when you have the possibilities to choose from the soda machines now. They have all the buttons and the menus and things like that with the screen. Well, if we went old school and we just had the, the pressing options, and let's say that there are 14 total options, but we don't want to fill up all 14 different drinks because, let's be honest, that's disgusting. You only want to choose four different types of uh, different sodas to put in your drink. How many different options or drink combinations are there? So you have to think, we have 14 different items to choose from. The order doesn't matter here because it's the end result of the mix. So if I choose Mountain Dew first followed by High C second, that's the same outcome uh, as doing High C first and then Mountain Dew second. It doesn't matter the order that you put them in. So I'm going to be using a combination of 14 different sodas, a combination, and I'm choosing four of them to put in my final drink. And so 14 factorial divided by 4 factorial, and that gets rid of the uh, different orders, and then 14 minus 4 factorial. So really, this is a, a little bit more work here, 14 factorial over 4 factorial times 10 factorial on the denominator leads us to 1,001 different drink uh, combinations. And again, combinations are the thing to do here because the order that you put these uh, different types of sodas together doesn't matter. The outcome is the same, the group is the same. So in terms of multiplying in math, this would be 14 factorial all the way down, 14, 13, 12, 10, 11 times, all the way down to 1. And then you would be dividing by 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and then it's that second part that snips away the parts of the top that you don't want. So it would be snipping away 10 and 9 and 8 and 7 and 6. And so what you're left with, 14 times 13 times 12 times 11 divided by 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And if you multiply that and you do the correct order of operations, you're going to get the same answer. It's just a little faster if you know how to use the factorial button on your calculator. It'll get you to that result uh, without all the multiplying and maybe putting in a wrong number. What about number 11? During Super Bowl 52, I think that's 52, I'm a little rusty on my Roman numerals here. Uh, anyway, the Philadelphia Eagles uh, beat the New England Patriots. Pringles ran a commercial touting the fact that you can mix and match their different chip flavors to create your own recipes. Revolutionary, right? Now, if there were 13 different flavors in the U.S., and you would be 
making a triple layer Pringle creation, a Pringle stack, how many different combinations or recipes could you make? If there are 34 different flavors in the United States, which I think is actually true, there might be more now, to be honest, and you want to make a triple layer recipe or a Pringles creation, how many unique combinations are there? So out of the 34 possibilities, the order of the Pringles doesn't matter because it's the same end creation in the end. You could maybe argue with me on that, but for the problem, it's a combination because the order doesn't matter and we need three of them. It's a triple stacker. And so 34 factorial divided by 3 factorial and then multiply that by 34 minus 3 factorial, which is 31 factorial. You'll notice on the bottom, these numbers always end up adding to what the top is. That's a nice little handy way to remember how combinations work. So 30 factorial over 3 factorial, 31 factorial is 5,984 different Pringles combinations. So somebody needs to make a recipe book for this because that would be glorious. Some of them probably would not be very good. I would imagine many of them are not good. And remember, the order doesn't matter, and so switching where a Pringle is in the stack, I don't care. I'm not going to dedicate a new page to that because it's, it's bogus. That's silly. Why would I do that? So permutations have their place and combinations have their place. But because we are not going and stacking up all 34 different chips and we're stopping early, that's going to limit us here to a combination or a permutation. Just have to make that choice between order or not. Number 12 is a conceptual problem. If we have the same problem using the same n and k values, which would be larger? P or C, permutations or combinations, and why? Permutations are typically going to be larger because if you change the order, like 1, 2, or 2, 1, it creates a new answer. Combinations don't do that. They would say that the outcome is the same since they both have a 1 and a 2. The order doesn't matter. Now, there are special situations where actually permutations, combinations, and factorials are all the same, but it depends on how many things you choose. It's a little bit of a rare situation to be in, so otherwise, besides for that small technicality, permutations are always bigger than combinations. I would encourage you guys to pause the video for question 13. Uh, the answers here are going to go pretty rapid fire. We're just identifying if a situation warrants a permutation or a combination and being able to argue for why it's going to be one versus not the other. So take a second and I want you to try all the different sub-questions in 13 and then you can go ahead and hit play and check your answers as we go. Hope you guys had a second to do that. So question A says, suppose that seven people enter a swim meet, assuming that there are no ties, how many ways could the gold, silver, and bronze medals be awarded? This is a permutation. The order matters. You wouldn't just switch first and second place and say, oh, it's the same outcome. Okay, who finishes in first, second, and third uh, makes a difference here, so permutation. B, how many different committees of three people can be chosen to work on a special project from a group of nine people? This is a combination. So it's the group of people as a committee. There is not a head of the committee or a secretary or a treasurer. There's not position or ranking. So this is just all about the group, which is a combination. C, a coach must choose how to line up his five starters from a team of 12 players. How many different ways can the coach choose the starters? Now, this one has a little bit more argument to it. I would say this is a permutation because uh, usually in sports, the position that you play is uh, a little bit different for each individual. So you have a point guard, you have a, a wing, you have a center, you have a, a small forward, things like that. You can't just switch people around and where they are. All right, so if you're talking about where those people are starting, I would argue that's a permutation. Now, if you're just putting people out there, and you say it's the same five people as if I switch you know, who's announced first or whatever, then you could argue it's a combination. So if you're announcing them, I don't care. But if they're playing a, a specific spot, then that order matters. D, John bought a machine to make fresh juice. And he has five different fruits, strawberries, oranges, apples, pineapples, and lemons. If he only uses two fruits, how many different juice drinks can he make? I don't care about the order here, I care about what's the end result. So this is definitely a combination, similar to the soda question we did earlier. 
E, how many different four-letter passwords can be created for a software access if no letter can be used more than once? This is a permutation. Because the order matters for passwords, you can't just switch around where the letters are, like you wouldn't be allowed access. That definitely screams permutation to me. F, how many different ways can you elect a chairman and a co-chairman of a committee if you just have 10 people to choose from? Because there is a ranking between the two, uh, and being chairman versus being co-chairman, they probably have different responsibilities. This is a permutation. G, there are 25 people who work in an office together. Five of those people are elected to go to the same conference in Orlando, Florida. How many different ways can this team of five people be chosen before they go to the conference? This is a combination. The order doesn't matter, it's the same group of people, and so I don't, I don't care who gets called first. On the next page, H, there are 25 people who work in an office together. Five of these people are selected to attend five different conferences. The first person selected will go to a conference in Hawaii. The second person will go to New York. The third person will go to San Diego. The fourth person will go to Atlanta. And the fifth person will go to Nashville. I feel sorry for that person. They don't get any of the really cool spots. No offense, Nashville, but I'd rather go to Hawaii. How many such possibilities are there? So this is definitely a permutation because when they are called dictates where they will go. And the order matters here. Uh, first and second are going to different spots than if I had switched them and made that person go first and the other person go second. So permutations. I, John couldn't recall the serial number on his expensive bicycle. He remembered that there were six different digits. None of them were used more than once, but he couldn't remember what digits were used. He decided to write down all the possible six-digit numbers. How many different possibilities does he have to write down? This is a permutation. So for serial codes or uh, numbers that identify things, you can't just switch the order and say it's the same. Okay, they're unique. So permutation would be what you do there. Jay, how many different seven-card hands can be chosen from a standard 52-card deck? If you're playing a card game, you know, what's the outcome of getting, or how many possibilities are there for getting a hand? This is a combination. I don't care what order I get the cards in, because maybe I'll just rearrange them in my hand anyway. So it can be tricky if you are creating a, a hand that you then play from. The order really doesn't matter. It's the group of cards that you have. Some games, that is not true. Some games, if you get certain cards in an order, that might mean something. And so you have to be careful. It's dependent on the rules of the game. Okay, 112 people bought raffle tickets to enter a random drawing for three prizes. How many ways can three names be drawn for first prize, second prize, and third prize? Because there is an order and there's a difference between getting drawn in what situation and what prize you get, this is a permutation. A disc jockey, which that's actually where DJ comes from, didn't know if you guys knew that, a DJ has to choose three songs for the last few minutes of his evening show. Now, if there are nine songs that he feels would be appropriate for that time slot, how many ways can he choose and arrange to play the three of the nine songs? Now, order here kind of matters. The flow of the songs, like you wouldn't want to go from a, a fast song to a slow song. You know, maybe switching those around would, would be a better uh, outro than, than the first option. And so I would argue that it's a permutation because you want to make that list and because it says arrange in the problem, it kind of gives you that hint that this is a permutation and not a combination. I hope you guys had some success with those. In order to solve any of those problems, you have to first be able to identify what you are going to do. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at 14. So a school offers two reserved parking spaces to its students with permission to drive to campus. And each month, the student council member conducts a golden ticket lottery during an all-school assembly to choose the two lucky drivers. So these must be up front, super close to the door, uh, you know, great spots, extra wide parking spaces so you don't get dinged by some other dumb driver. Now on one occasion, the person doing the drawing was an AP Stats student. And when both students who were chosen for the special parking spots were members of the same AP Stats class, some of the other students observing kind of complained that the drawing was unfair. How likely? is that, that this event would happen if you have 120 eligible student drivers and then 30 students in the AP stats class. 
And what we're going to do here seems a little counterintuitive, but we're going to try all three methods. We're going to try the general multiplication rule, we're going to you look at permutations, and we're going to look at combinations. So we're interested, how likely, what's the probability that one of these stat students would get drawn out of the total number of students? And so setting that fraction up, we have the stats out of total idea for this fraction. General multiplication rule says that I need to take that first position, that first ticket drawn, and I need to see, well, what are the odds? So there are 30 total students who could be drawn from the AP stats class out of a total of 120 possibilities. And that's the first ticket, but they draw two tickets. And so I have this second spot where I'm going to take the possibilities that are there, which if I draw one from the stats class, there's one less. There are 29 students who are still available to be drawn. And out of the total is also adjusted. It's 119 students. So 30 out of 120 times 29 out of 119. If I multiply those up, I get 870 divided by 14,280. As a decimal, that's just 0 0.06092 blah, blah, blah. So we have about a 6% chance that two AP stat students are going to be chosen out of 120 students total for these parking spots. It's not too bad. The fraction work is actually similar to when we did uh, probability tree diagrams last chapter. But how do permutations and combinations fit in with this? Well, if we still think about the same idea, uh, what's the possibility of stat students being chosen out of the total number of students? We have to think specifically about the top. How many possibilities are there for stat students? And so out of those 30 kids, and if I'm saying permutations, the order matters here. Uh, maybe somebody gets a spot that's closer to the school versus further away. Out of those 30 students, and it's a permutation, I need to be picking two of them. So I have 30 P2. Okay, that's the total number of options of picking two stat students from a class of 30. And if you put that in your calculator, you're going to get 870. If you do it with factorials, that's 30 factorial divided by 28 factorial. You go back to their definitions. So 870 different ways on top, which you're already probably seeing, matches up with the work we've done. On the bottom, I have 120 students total, and I need to be picking, where the order matters here, two of those students. And so this is out of everybody. How many options are there for everybody? And so 120 P2, which would be 120 factorial, divided by 118 factorial, is 14,280. Dividing those numbers is the same exact percent. It's 6%, 6.09% to be exact. It's crazy that permutations and the general multiplication rule are getting the same result, but that general multiplication rule is really hidden within factorials. And factorials are hidden within permutations. So maybe the difference between those two, the general multiplication rule, they could park wherever. Permutation says that the order that they're drawn makes a difference, maybe in where they park. The last one, combinations say it's just the group that matters in the end. It's the two individuals who are drawn. The order doesn't matter. And we're still taking the odds of stats being drawn out of the total number of options. So for this, it's 30C2, 30 combination 2, for the stats class. 30 students possible, two students drawn, don't care about the order. And so if I do that, going back to the definitions, 30 factorial divided by 2 factorial, 28 factorial. That's 435 possibilities. Notice how that total number of possibilities is smaller than the permutations, because the order doesn't matter here. Okay, That means switching those two students is really the same group of two. So that goes on top. On the bottom, I'm taking 120 students for the total, and the combination of picking out two of those students, where the order doesn't matter, is going to leave me with 7,140 possibilities. If I divide 435 by 7,140, guess what decimal I get? 0 0.06092 blah blah blah, which is the same 6%. So there are times when you are finding probability where combinations and 
permutations and the general multiplication rule or factorials and things like that will all output the same chance. It's just the interpretation of those, meaning do they have to park in a certain spot for permutations or can they park wherever they want it's just whoever gets their first combinations, that grouping idea. It's dependent on the problem and you need to make that choice based on how they word things. That's the trickiest part, which is why we practiced identifying in question 13. Hopefully after that question you're a little bit more confident in your ability to do all three types. It's just a lot of factorials, it's a lot of multiplying when you really get down to it. But it's so cool that you can think about how many possibilities there are total. Once you know this type of math, you see it in so many places out in the real world. If you go to restaurants or if you're driving or if you're at home and the number of things that you could do, it's a fun idea to try to put out in the real world. All right, guys, the last question on the notes, kind of a little bit of a throwback. I'm showing my age here, um, but playlists. Most people don't do playlists on their own anymore. They just uh, subscribe to Spotify or you know Pandora or things like that, and they have them curated for them. But back in my day, uh, we took pride in you know arranging the songs and maybe sharing them on CDs as you would burn CDs and give them to a friend and things like that. And so this question deals with uh, someone who wants to do something similar. Janine wants to set up a playlist on her iPhone with eight songs. So it's a very short playlist and that's it. She has 75 songs to choose from including 15 by Fall Out Boy, uh, 12 by 21 Pilots, 10 by Maroon 5. How many different sets of eight songs are possible for Janine's playlist assuming that the order of the songs here doesn't matter? So this has nothing to do with the artist. It has more to do with the number of possibilities and what you're choosing out of those. So think about the total number of songs to choose from. There are 75 total. Out of those 75, I'm going to be picking eight of them. Now the order doesn't matter here, so it's a combination, not a permutation. Typing that in your calculator gives you actually an answer in scientific notation. It says 1.69 times 10 the 10 or 1.69 e10. Now what that e10 says is that you need to move that decimal place 10 spots to the right because it's a positive. If you had an e with a negative number you'd move it to the left and make it a smaller amount. So this number of options should be big. That's 16 billion different possibilities. That's outrageous. A asks us, how many different eight song playlists can Janine create if the order of the songs does matter? So that first part was like, I don't care if they're in different orders, but what if the order starts to make a difference? If I hear one song first and then a different song second, if I switch those, maybe I would feel differently, have a different response to that. So all we're going to be doing here is changing the type of math from a combination to a permutation. So instead of 75C8, it's 75P8, order matters here. And what we see with our answer, if you type that in your calculator, 6.8 times 10 to the 14, it's not the fact that 6.8 is bigger than 1.69, it's the scientific notation and it's the exponent that is the biggest difference maker. So if you have E14, you're moving that decimal place 14 spots to the right, which is a much larger number in size than moving it just 10 spots to the right. I mean, they're both big, don't get me wrong, but that is 680 trillion different possibilities compared to 16 billion. That's factors of size larger. Now, both of those answers are somewhat approximate, okay? Typing it in a calculator usually gives you with a, a decimal with lots of different digits in it and it's just not enough screen real estate to, to put out the whole number all at once. So technically I think it's 680 trillion, 240 billion, 886 million, and it keeps on going. But it's hard for us to get the whole number all at once. So if you round a little bit, that's fine with me. Usually we won't do questions where there are such an enormous amount of options available. Usually they'll be small and manageable. Let's look at B. How many eight song playlists contain only songs by Fall Out Boy? 
I don't know why you'd want that, but maybe you would. So what's the possibility or the probability that this happens if she decides to let her iPhone select the eight songs at random? It would seem kind of weird if you have it on shuffle to hear the same band and then hear the same band again. Maybe that's happened to you sometimes. But then to hear it a third time and a fourth time and eight songs in a row. How likely is that? Is what we're finding here, especially if they only have 15 songs in the, in the first place. So that's kind of the key here. I need to take what are the odds of Fallout Boy out of what are the odds total, all right? So out of the Fallout Boy um, possibilities, there are 15 songs to choose from, and I'm cho choosing eight of them. Now here, uh, let's kind of go with the idea that the order matters, okay? We'll stick with that uh, concept. If the order matters of those eight songs, we have 15 that we can choose from, and we're choosing eight. 15 P8 is 259,459,200 different possible eight song playlists for Fall Out Boy. Now out of the total, which is uh, 75 P8, it's the total number of ways that you can choose eight songs out of the 75, that was that huge number from part A. We need to divide our answer that we just got by the answer that we got from part A, and we get 3.8 times 10 to the negative 7. Is that big or is that small? Well, the negative exponent, or E negative 7, says move your decimal place six, 7 times to the left, which makes 0 .0000038. Yeah, that is a teeny tiny percent. The odds of getting eight songs in a row and shuffle, you know, selected at random, is almost zero. It will hardly ever happen that you get eight songs from that same artist if you're on shuffle, which seems reasonable to us. Like, that's never happened to me. It would be, you know, just a couple times out of a trillion if you tried to get that playlist to work out. Interestingly enough, if you had done this with combinations, if you said, ah, oh, the order doesn't matter, uh, there are 6,435 ways, if the order of that playlist doesn't matter, to get all Fallout Boy songs, eight out of eight songs from them. Okay, but if you would be dividing from that answer, which we got at the very top of the notes, you're still going to get the exact same percent, 0 0.000038. You get the same decimal, it's just the context saying the order matters, how you hear those songs, or the order doesn't matter, it's the group of those songs. So probability kind of uh, levels the playing field between those. Okay, because you're dividing, it's the same ratio in the end. Which is interesting and something I never really grasped when I first learned about permutations and combinations. C kind of rescues us a little bit. It says, how many eight song playlists contain no songs by Fall Out Boy? Oh, thank goodness. Well, what's the probability that this happens if she decides to let her iPhone select eight songs at random? We would be missing this artist in the end. They're not in our songs that we hear. So no fallout boy, we have to actually subtract from the number of possibilities that are available to us. If there were 15 songs by fallout boy out of the 75, 75 subtracting 15 leaves us with 60 different songs to choose from. I don't care who it is, but those are the 60 possibilities. So that's the group I'm going to be selecting from, and we're saying that the order matters here, and so it's a permutation, but I'm still selecting 8 songs for the playlist. So 60p8. And if I do that, I get 1.03 times 10 to the 14th power. Dividing that by the total number of possibilities out of 75 songs, picking eight of them, where the order matters, that answer from up above, the answer from part A, if you will, I'm going to get the decimal after dividing of 0.15165 blah blah blah. So that's a 15.1% chance there's not going to be a single Fallout Boy song on this playlist, which is actually higher odds than you would expect. It's certainly a, a larger percentage than the prior answer. Just like the answer for part B, if I had done this with combinations and said the order of the playlist doesn't matter, I get different numbers, but their ratio is still at 15%. Okay, so depending on your situation, you can still get the right answer if you are saying the order doesn't matter versus the order does matter. Part D, what's the probability that all eight songs are by 21 Pilots? So 21 Pilots has 12 songs total on this iPhone, and so out of those 12, you're picking eight of them. We're going to take all of those 
possibilities, all of those different playlists. And we're going to divide that by the total number of ways to choose eight songs. So 75 P8. So 12 P8 divided by 75 P8. That's really easy to put in your calculator. It's going to give you the answer of 2.93 E negative 8, which if you move that decimal place eight spots to the left, it's an even smaller answer than before. So because there are less songs from 21 Pilots, there's actually a decreased chance. It's even rarer that we would get uh, a full playlist of just those um, band songs, which makes sense. If 30 of the songs were by a certain artist, it's more likely that you're going to get a playlist full of those artist songs. If there were only eight songs and I wanted all eight of them to be uh, randomly picked by shuffle, that's never going to happen. That's like so ridiculously small. So in terms of a decimal, uh, that's .00000002. There would be seven zeros since you move the decimal eight spots to the left. Last problem, similar to the other parts on this question, what's the probability that all eight songs are by 21 Pilots, Fall Out Boy, or Maroon 5? So what if they are by any of those three bands? So we need to figure out the total number of possibilities for those three bands. Fall Out Boy had 15, 21 Pilots had 12, and then Maroon 5 had 10 songs. And that brings us to a total, 15 plus 12 plus 10 is 37 songs that we could choose from. Now, going with the idea that the order matters, if you get certain songs in a certain situation, 37 is what I can choose from, then I'm going to pick eight of those 37, so 37P8. If I go ahead and if I divide that by 75P8, the total number of ways just to pick eight songs in general, where the order matters, you're going to get the decimal point zero zero two two eight eight blah blah blah. That, as a percent, is a 0.2% chance, a fifth of a percent, which in terms of percentages, it's one of the a higher percents from those problems that we've done. It'll happen once out of every 500 times that you try to make an eight-song playlist. It's not crazy impossible, but it's still not very likely. The things that kind of make permutations and combinations click is the number that you are choosing from and then how big of a group you are choosing from that number. Okay, The closer those things tend to get, the more possibilities there are because they get closer to factorials in the end. Just like the other problems, if you had done combinations with this, saying that the order of that playlist doesn't matter, you're going to get the same ratio. All right. Combinations for those 37 songs, if you were choosing 8 of them, you would get 38,608 and 20 different options, but you're dividing that by a slightly different um, amount with 75C8. In the end, that ratio is still that 0.2% that we said. Usually we're going to give you a pretty clear directive on what options you should be looking for, but you still need to know how to do them. Okay? For some of your homework, I would like you to try doing the math, meaning having the factorials and the dividing and everything like that, in addition to the symbol notation, so like 12P8 or 37P8, whatever that might be. All right, it's good to get both sides of the issue. In the end, you can type it in your calculator, and your calculator will output what you need. Okay? But understanding where a problem is taking you and how to get around obstacles is an important thing. Probabilities tend to even out the playing field. I hope you guys learned a lot from this set of notes. I love combinations, permutations, and factorials. So interesting. Hopefully you guys enjoyed them as much as I did. And if you liked this video, go ahead and hit subscribe. I'd greatly appreciate it. And we'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks, guys. Take care.